I always thought, hey, insurance is a scam. Like these people are always pushing insurance on me and I hate it. And for the longest time, I went with the Dave Ramsey philosophy of buy term and invest the difference. Always did that, right? Uh, I just got fed into that and I believed it for a very long time until I met someone actually as a part of my multifamily journey. Um, and Elisa and I actually know him in common. This guy is an amazing, he's an ex Wall Street banker, super sharp, super smart. And he carries over $25 million in death benefit in insurance policies. And I'm thinking if Raj, not this Raj, but the other Raj, this Raj is smart too, by the way, but the other Raj is doing something that is a method to his madness. He doesn't do anything if it doesn't make him money, right? So I started researching this whole concept much more and I was really intrigued. And there is a book I read called Money, Wealth and Life Insurance. Uh, please email me at, I should have put my contact information here, but I think I have it at the end of the presentation, but email me and I'll send you a copy of the book. Uh, it's called Money, Wealth and Life Insurance, How the Wealthy Supercharge Their Savings. So that was an eye-opening book for me. Uh, that was my introduction to infinite banking. And then I started reading more, I started learning so much. And someone tried to sell me a policy and he didn't want to explain anything to me. And I wasn't very confident in the purchase. And I think when you want to buy something you want to, or invest in something and you really want to understand what you're investing into, right? And I was like that. I was like, I'm not buying anything I don't understand. And this person did not explain it to me well, so I refused to buy. So long story short, I, I ended up researching this so much that I ended up getting a life insurance license. And I said, this is a great thing for my investors to do. Uh, and I'll talk about why. And it just kind of went on from there. And I think there are some questions. Okay, I'm gonna get to the questions at the end of the discussion so it's not choppy. Um, and I think Elisa, thank you for putting the email in there. Um, so I am, I started Cherry Street Investments, but I also became an affiliate of a company called Paradigm Life uh, that focuses very much on this infinite banking or what is called perpetual wealth strategy. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about what is the strategy? Why is it useful? What are some of the benefits of the strategy? So uh, how many of you would like to create a safe high yield bank account? I was driving the other day and I saw Velocity Bank account, something, you know, Velocity Credit Union, high interest bank account. And it showed me 0.7 or something like that. And I was like, are they kidding me? Uh, the, the inflation is probably at about three and it'll probably go up some more. And how am I going to, I'm losing money if I put it in the savings account at 7.7%. .7%. So I'm talking about a five to 6% tax-free high yield bank account. If you said yes to this, then you're in the right place. Are you wondering if a 529 plan is the right vehicle for your college savings? 529 plans allow you for tax-free growth of your account, of your uh, kid's college education uh, savings, but the, the money has to be used only for college savings or, or qualified educational purposes. You can't go use it for something else which is considered a non-qualified purpose, uh, a non-educational non purpose. So it kind of is restrictive and a 529 plan also dings your student or your child if they're applying for financial aid. So I don't believe, I think infinite banking policies can be a superior alternative to 529 plans. Let's look at, do you want an account that's like a Roth IRA, which allows for tax-free growth, but the Roth comes with a 6K limit and most of us can't even um, contribute to the Roth. So if you can contribute to the Roth, I would highly suggest that because you can never consider that taxes will not go up. Uh, everybody puts money away in 401 case thinking, oh, I don't have to pay taxes right now. But what you're not counting for is the tax rate when you actually take the money out, which is probably likely to be higher, never lower, right? So consider this way, you pay the taxes right now, put it away in a Roth, it grows. It's the same way with life insurance policies. You do post-tax dollars, which I have another strategy for not doing post-tax dollars. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in this presentation. 
Um, so you basically are taking post-tax dollars and putting it away, but you can contribute much more than 6K. If you want to contribute much more than 6K in a Roth IRA-like account, then you're in the right place. Would you also like to save money in an asset protected vehicle? Let's, let's look at it. Your savings account is not protected from, asset, from uh, lawsuits unless you put it inside an LLC like Toby and Clint talked about. Clint talked about it. Uh, your brokerage account is not protected from uh, lawsuits. Your investments are not protected from lawsuits unless you set up all these LLCs around them. But you know what is protected from lawsuits? what I'm going to talk about today. You can use it for investments. You can use it for college savings. You can use it for retirement. You can use it for all these purposes. And it comes with inbuilt asset protection. If you said yes to any of the above questions, you are in the right place, my friend. And today, this is what we're going to talk about. Before I jump in, this is my why. You know, Elisa, Ted, what is your why? Why are you here? Why are you doing the things you're doing, right? Uh, I'm a single mom. I have been for the last 15 years. And this is my why. My daughter drives me. She keeps me accountable uh, to deliver, to do things, um, and not, not to be down too long. Uh, but I also have these two little cute puppies. That, that's my family. And um, this is my why. This is what prompted me. Like, my daughter is going to be in college in two years. Uh, so I really wanted to stay home more. And I was traveling a lot with my previous job. And I, I love travel, but for fun, I don't enjoy travel for work, especially when it gets uh, too often. So I really wanted to stay home and work from home more. And that's kind of what drove me to move to real estate full time. Um, although COVID has shut down travel, I'm hoping we'll travel for fun more and less for work. So Elisa already introduced me. I'm not going to spend too much time here. I'm passionate about investor education. I went to a and I moved here in 1998, and I have been in Austin since 2000. So I've been, spent a lot of time in Austin. I, besides doing a lot of investor education, I, I invest passively in real estate as well. I have a cash value policy. I have actually two for myself, and also I'm a realtor based in the Austin area. So before we jump in, let me move this zoom bar out of the way because it always obstructs my view here. Um, oops, let's get back there. All right, let's talk about this is, I found this to be again, one of my aha moments because a lot of times we focus, I talk to a lot of investors and they invest and they're like, what do you invest in? They invest in stock market, that's it. 80% of the assets are in stock market. And when you consider what diversification means to you, uh, what diversification meant to me 10 years ago is very different from what diversification means to me today. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, when I was uh, 10 years ago, I was working for IBM and I was investing my 401k in stock market. And for me, diversification was mid cap, large cap, small cap, um, you know, foreign funds, whatever else, right? Everything was in the stock market. So really uh, what happened in 2008 was my 401k was half the amount, just like everybody else is out there. I'm sure you you saw that. And I really stood back and looked at it, looked at my portfolio and went, am I really diversified? Because I own nothing right now. Like I lost half of my money in the stock market. I pretty much was down to nothing with my, I, ha, I had no houses. I had no real estate at all before 2009. So I really took a step back and analyzed where I was and I couldn't have drawn this image, but I realized that I'm just diversified wrongly. So if you look at what stock market is, it's just speculation. It carries a very high amount of risk and it carries a very low amount of control because you just don't know where the market's gonna to be. Today, things are good, tomorrow things might not be. And that's exactly what we all went through in 2008 and it's, it can happen again, right? What we need to do instead, if you look at how the wealthy build their foundation, they start from the bottom here, right? They call it the tier one. What is your tier one? It's your savings and your protection. You protect your life right? You protect, if anything happens to you, your earning potential needs to be protected. You have your savings, which might mean six months of emergency reserves. 
Uh, if anything happens to your job, you have a backup. So that foundation has to be very strong for you to build the rest of your diversification on top of it. So tier two, what is tier two? Tier two is when you go buy a house or you invest in yourself, your education or whatever else. It's a direct investment in something tangible, right? Whether it's your education or a house or a property or whatever investment you make. Um, it's not stock market because you have zero control over it. In a direct investment, you have full control over it, right? And as you're um, indirect investing, let's come to the tier three, uh, let's say you're doing a syndication. We consider that slightly higher risk because the minute you let go of your money and control to someone else, you have no control over what happens. Uh, could, uh, did COVID stop a lot of distributions on these properties? Absolutely. Some of the sponsors held back distributions. So there's always a risk reward ratio. And we are here, we're talking about a risk and control ratio. The, the lower the control, the higher the risk. And you do want to take a certain amount of risk with your portfolio to grow it because you can't just sit in savings all day long, right? You have to structure it so that you are diversified across those four tiers rather than just sitting in tier four and diversifying across tier four. You want to build up those tiers and diversify across the four tiers. Uh, so what we want to do is make this tier one really, really strong so that you can weather any storms in two, three, and four. So let's say I have a good amount of savings, a uh, good amount of emergency reserves put away from my business. I can weather much more in the other three tiers. What's happening in the other three, three tiers when we have that savings and protection in the first tier. So let's talk about investment versus savings. I wanna really clarify this point because a lot of people when I talk about insurance and life insurance policies for infinite banking, I tell people, oh, you can make about five or 6% tax-free. And suddenly they're like, uh, I don't think so. I make over 10% in the stock market. Now understand that your money sitting in a life insurance policy is protected. It's not an investment, it's a savings. So you have to compare life insurance uh, to a savings account and not to an investment. So your tiers two to four are your investments because they carry a certain amount of risk, however low that risk might be. Life insurance, like a savings account, almost carries no risk. And we'll talk about the safety of life insurance, just like your savings account is FDIC insured. We'll talk about how life insurance is protected against losses. So you cannot lose your principal in life insurance. So consider this, a tier one investment, um, emergency reserves are there, high cash value life insurance policies. So the tiers two to four carry a certain amount of risk. Let's say you buy a house. Sure, your house is fine. I mean, it's probably gonna be fine, but let's say the housing prices dropped in 2008 and nine, you know, people sank and went under. So you can still lose your tier two investment, but the probability is just lower, right? Uh, versus your speculation, like where the probability is just higher because you have no control over it. So your returns are always proportional to risk and there is just no getting around it. So bottom line, you need to compare life insurance returns to a savings account and not to a tier two or tier three or tier four account. So let's look at this. This was an interesting way to look at it. So let's say you have three buckets of money and you need a, uh, you have a million dollars, but you want to take out 80K to live on off, off those million dollars. The first bucket, you will put that million dollars in. You have it in, let's say, a pre-tax bucket. What is a pre-tax bucket? Uh, let's say a four, uh, 401K, right? You, you have basically put away money in a 401k, now you're going to take it out, right? Or uh, you, so the second bucket is a post-tax bucket. So essentially you pay taxes on this already, right? And, but the growth is taxed. So let's say you put it in a stock market, right? Uh, whatever money you're making, you have capital gains, but your growth is taxed. Even if you have dividend income coming in from uh, dividend stocks, your growth, I mean, your dividends are taxed, right? So that's your post-tax bucket. The third bucket is a tax-free bucket. Uh, for example, life insurance actually falls in there. And we'll talk about how that works. 
So the thing with the, the pre-tax bucket is that we call it Congress's playground because you're basically putting in money today thinking that you will not pay as much taxes in the future. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna retire poorer than I am while I'm working. I wanna have a comparable lifestyle. I wanna make good amount of money, if not more, to support my travel and all my hobbies. So I don't want to leave my money at the risk of not, you know, of, of paying higher taxes in the future. So you're basically kicking the can down the road, but you're really not getting away from pushing a lot of money into sol uh, 401ks. And I know a lot of my California investors dump 18,000 or the max out their 401ks. Think about it. I don't know how much it's gonna help you down the road. It's probably helping you right now because you're, you're taking away every dollar you can from having to pay taxes on it, but you're just kicking the can down the road. So if you have, you are in a 35% tax bracket, I believe it assumes, you will have $52,000 to spend from your 80K that you took out. This makes some assumptions. Let's just run with this. Um, so the growth is taxed. You're in a, in a uh, let's say, a stock market account, a brokerage account. You have about $66,000 to spend assuming a long-term capital gains. In life insurance, what's interesting is that you have the entire ADK to spend. And how we structure this is uh, up to cost basis. So let's say I put in $100,000 in my life insurance account. Obviously, these are post-tax dollars going in. They come out uh, tax-free. You already pay taxes, no big surprise there. But what's interesting is there is a way to tap the growth in the account, which has been tax-free growth. There's a way to tap it without paying taxes when you retire. And we will cover that today. Just be patient with me. So I want you guys to think about this. Which bucket do you want to fill? What is your ideal situation, right? Like, you, do you want to fill all? I mean, I assume you want to fill all the three buckets. But it, depending, it depends on your situation, right? If you're in California, you, you're going to try to get rid of your taxes right now. Maybe you want to max out your pre-tax bucket, but consider the tax-free bucket as well because it's available for you. You're not kicking the can down the road, but you'll actually end up spending, giving away less in taxes. So let's look at some key financial characteristics of different kinds of accounts. So we're looking at savings qualified accounts like 401ks, IRAs, uh, looking at home equity HELOCs, stock portfolio, and a life insurance policy. So from a safety standpoint, obviously 401k can be invested in the market. You can lose it. I lost half my 401k. HELOC um, can be, the interest rates can vary a lot because it's variable. Uh, the stock, for, stock market, we all know, not very safe, you could lose all of your money, right? Or a big chunk of your money. It happened in 2008, it can happen again. In savings account, obviously up to 250K, you have FDIC insurance, so it's all good. Uh, life insurance also very safe. You don't have to ever worry about losing your capital in a life insurance policy. How liquid, again, uh, a lot of them are liquid, obviously stock accounts liquid, your 401K is not liquid, you know, by the nature of it. Although the CARES Act has given us some incentive to pull out cash. Uh, savings account, liquid, it's yours to use. Life insurance, very liquid. And we'll talk about the liquidity in the life insurance account. Oh, I missed the other two, I'm sorry. Rate of return, savings account, 0.7% tops. That's what you can get in a money market account today. Uh, clearly doesn't cut it. You don't want your money sitting in a savings account. Uh, qualified account, if it's invested well, it can be great, but then it's, you have a lot of fees that you don't see on the back end. You know, your returns look great, but then you have all these management fees that your funds are charging. Uh, home equity line of credit, not great. Uh, depends on how it's invested. Stock portfolio, again, good. It can be great returns, but it comes at a risk, right? So kind of like risk reward ratio. Life insurance, the rate of return is really good. And we'll talk about what that money rate of return looks like shortly. And how is it taxed? Both your stock and savings account is taxed as uh, uh, capital gains and you pay capital gains tax. Uh, obviously a 401k is not taxed. Your HELOC is a refinance. So, I mean, sorry, you're pulling money out of your 
current equity out of your property. So no taxation at that point, only when you sell the property will you get taxed on your, say, uh, on your gains. Life insurance also no taxes, so we are good. So life insurance in, in short checks off all the, all the um, safety, liquidity, rate of return and taxation, all the key financial characteristics. I'm gonna uh, keep myself accountable for time because I talk a lot. Uh, if you haven't figured that out already. So I'm going to keep it quick. Um, think about your lifetime earning potential. You have a potential to earn for the rest of your life. Uh, think about it as a flow of, flow of water, flow of money, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you have a tax filter. You lose a lot of what you earn in taxes, some more than others. Sorry, people in California. Um, you have some supporting your standard of living, right? And then... Um, you hopefully have some which is going into your safe tank. What we call a safe tank is tank where you cannot lose your money or savings, right? Your savings accounts, your life insurance policy are safe tanks. You cannot lose your money there. In investments, like I mentioned, it doesn't matter how less low risk the investment is, you can always lose your money. So we, are, we talk about it as water evaporating, right? If water can evaporate from an investment tank, your principal can evaporate but the principle is going nowhere in a safe tank. So let's talk about this. I really like this analogy and it really resonated with me. So I wanna share it with you. So how can life insurance policy have your money to do jobs at once? So normally in a savings account, um, you have your emergency reserves. You might have your business and property reserves if you are a business owner, or if you have rental properties, you might have property reserves for those rental properties. And finally, you have your opportunity dollars. Opportunity dollars are dollars you wanna invest with, right? So let's look at how this plays out. So normally, let's say I saved up money, I put it away in a savings account, and I had those opportunity dollars and I went and made an investment with it. Normally my savings account would be empty now of those opportunity dollars. I still have my save emergency savings and business reserves, right? And let's say I went to bought a rental house. I paid that, let's say 20% down payment on, I emptied my savings account, right? And gave away the down payment and bought a house with a bank loan. Now, I basically, in, in a life insurance policy, let's assume now your savings account was replaced by a life insurance policy, right? This entire thing now is sitting in a life insurance policy, the emergency reserves, the property and business reserves, and your opportunity dollars. Now, instead of actually emptying the bank account, here's what it would look like. Your money would still be sitting in the life insurance policy. The insurance company, this is insurance company, would give you a loan for your down payment. So basically your money is still earning here while you get a loan and pay the, pay, pay the down payment. Is there an interest rate for the loan? Absolutely. And we'll talk about how that stacks up, but understand that, that this is the same dollar that's working here and here, if that makes sense. So, Normally, uh, you look at the power of compounding uh, when you don't pay credit card debt. Let's say a lot of people in this country uh, that Dave Ramsey kind of talks to and Suze Arman, uh, they pay a lot of interest on debt, right? The credit card piles up compounding, you know, the compounding effect, it really kills you. The problem is on the other side, on when you're growing your wealth, you're not compounding it in a savings account because you save, 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 pay cash for something. Let's say you buy a house, you now come down to zero opportunity dollars. Then you again save and start the cycle over. So essentially you're never using the power of compounding in your favor. And what life insurance po policy allows you to do, a high cash value life insurance policy that is structured right. Not every life insurance policy is structured right. So a policy that is structured right allows you to utilize the compounding effect in your favor, not against you. So just to, to give you a preview, the true cost of paying cash, this shows how your policy compounds. 
uh, in uh, the red bars in a savings account, you empty it. Savings account, again, compound, uh, a compound for four years, five years and empty it. So this shows it typical, the red bar showed the savings account. This is what happens, my friend, when you allow money to compound without interruption. This is called uninterrupted compounding. And that's really the true power of uh, a life insurance account where you can save a thousand a month for 20, I believe it's 30 years, it would be a million dollars, right? So the compounding effect is um, very powerful and it's really not very high interest rate shown here. I forget what the, uh, what the assumptions are, but I believe it's 5% or less. So let's look at the loan thing. I know we talked about taking a loan away, loan from the life insurance policy. So essentially, let's say you accumulated money in a life insurance policy. You decided to take a loan against your, your life insurance policy with the policy as a collateral with the, the money, the cash value in your policy. What does it look like when you actually go buy a house versus you're using uh, what is what is the growth of your money inside the policy? Some people will go, hey, I'm paying 5% interest on the loan and I'm growing the money at 5% of the policy, kind of like a wash, right? Wrong, it's not a wash. So here's how you really use the power of this policy. So let's say you have $50,000 in your life insurance policy is growing at 5% interest for 25 years. The amount of interest that you will earn on, on the policy at just 5% tax-free please note it's all tax-free, is $124,000 on your $50,000, right? So your final balance is 174. Now let's say I borrow at the same time that I put in 50,000, I borrowed 50,000 and I went and invested that as a 20% down payment for a house, which is now generating cash flow every month. I took that cash flow and I started paying back my loan with the insurance company at 5% interest. And that's the key here. You're repaying back the loan every month. And this is what your curve looks like for the loan repayment. And the total interest paid over 25 years is 37,689. And I'm sure you guys can do the math here. You end up way far ahead. Now imagine re doing the strategy over and over again for everything that you buy. It is powerful, right? So what can you use a IB policy or a WMA or we call, we call a wealth maximization account policy for? Pretty much anything. You can use it to buy a car. Right now, I would just get a car loan, 0% interest. Um, you can use it to fund your uh, doodads, your education, your kids' education. Uh, just pay it back, right? Pay it back slowly and surely whenever you can. And you don't have to pay it back. You want to pay it back. I always say this, uh, life insurance company will never ask you to pay back the loan. They just keep accruing the interest on the loan, which you don't want to accrue. You want to pay it back as you cash flow from the house or uh, as you save up for your kid's education or you invest in some other investment or like a syndicated deal or you said you're doing a business, you have cash flow paid back because the amount of interest you pay back will be far less than the amount of uninterrupted growth or compounding effect that you get in the policy. And I think I might uh, really have a lot of slides. So I'm gonna like kind of breeze through uh, this. So I have some assumptions here. Uh, let's assume, we assume a 4% guaranteed return on cash value. This is very typical of an insurance policy. You'll always get a 4% guaranteed return and it's, it's tax-free return. Uh, we also assume like a 2.37% dividends, um, mutual life, what, what we call mutual life insurance companies pay dividends. You're like the policy holder and also a shareholder in their company. So they give you profit sharing. Um, so this just shows some examples of how your 20K contribution every year works in a life insurance policy. I'm not going to go into details right now. Um, I need to go back here. So let's say you contributed 20K for 24 years in this example, tax-free, insurance gross tax-free, if it's set up right, 30-year net is 1.3 million. And your IRR on your cash value, it seems very low at 5.37, but it's tax-free, okay? Uh, now look at your savings. You will need to make 8.26% in your savings account every single year to match that 5 point something percent in your um, life insurance account. 
looking at a managed investment account, if you're paying a management fee and you're paying taxes, you need to make 10% every single year. So stock market people, can you make 10% every single year on your portfolio? I don't think so. I haven't. Uh, there are a lot of down years. There are a lot of lean years. So essentially, this is what it stacks down to. If you want to get the same rate of return as a life insurance policy, you'll really need to make this consistently for the next 24 years in an investment, in a savings account or an investment. Savings is nowhere close to this at 0.7% right now. Uh, safety of insurance. I'm going to wrap it up in a couple of minutes so I have time for questions. I see a lot of questions. I don't think I'll be able to get through all of it, but we will get to uh, a discussion later uh, offline. FDIC has insurance, about 7% reserves to usually back up your savings account. And if you go and see what's called bank owned life insurance policies, which is very interesting, you can actually go to the FDIC website and look at this. Bank of America owns $22 billion of life insurance policies. So you really want to stop and think if 300 and 190 billion is carried by bank owned life insurance policies, uh, why aren't we doing this for ourselves, right? Why is the rich, why are the rich and the uh, corporates doing this while well, we don't do it for ourselves? They carry bank owned life insurance policies on all their key employees and as a, as a way of funding employee benefits and, and utilizing the tax-free savings prov uh, provisions. So it is a contract. There is a guaranteed 4% tax-free growth and companies that we work with have been around for 200 plus years and have paid through Great Depression and some more. So it's a very strong place to park your personal reserves instead of keeping it in a bank account and then start populating it with the emergency reserves. I mean, your business reserves and your opportunity dollars. That's kind of how I recommend doing this. Um, every state also has a guarantee fund if an insurance company goes out of business. And uh, we don't really work with a lot of small companies. We work with a lot of large companies that have been around for 200 plus years. So we're not really worried about them going out of business. So what's the cost? A lot of people ask me, how much do I have to pay for this? You don't have to pay anything for it. Um, the money comes out of your cash value initially for the first couple of years, and then you'll start to gain all your cash value back. There's always a catch, right? Uh, but your lifetime fees and charges work out to less than 1% of your total accumulated cash value, which is very low when you compare it to other managed investments. What is the key? Not every life insurance policy is good for this kind of infinite banking policy. It has to be structured right where you're contributing as much cash as possible into the policy. You want to minimize the expenses and charges. So the life insurance portion has to be the smallest amount that it can possibly be. And what we call the paid up additions or the cash value of the policies to be as high as possible. Uh, you have unlimited access to that cash value. You can use it as much as you want up to the cash value that you've accumulated. And you also have uninterrupted compounding while you reinvest it. I'm not going to get into this. Uh, this is a regular insurance policy. This is what a ca high cash value policy looks like. The insurance amount is really small compared to what we call the paid up additions that is liquid and flexible. What's the catch? You got to be healthy. It's better if you're healthy, right? If you have a lot of pre-existing conditions, your cost of insurance goes up. Not a big plus for you. Uh, you have to put money in before you can borrow. What I mean is usually takes a couple, first couple of years, we call it seasoning the policy. It, every dollar you put in is not a dollar you can take out immediately. It takes about three years. The first year you might have 75%, 77%, something like that. By the fourth or fifth year, you will have 100% or more of what you put in. And that's really when it, the, the policy accelerates. So you have to set it up right. Like I said, if you go set it up for a regular policy, you'll probably get like 5% or 10% of what you put in. We don't want that. We want a lot of the money you put in to be accessible as cash value. Just to summarize here, you have your liquidity. You have a lot of uh, multi-use savings. You can use it for any kind of investment or real estate. You can use it for college funding. You can use it for retirement as well opportunity cost, you're maximizing the opportunity cost by having the same dollar do more than one thing. 
and you're building tax-free generational wealth, my friends. This is really, really important. After you pass away, your, your, your child or your heirs are going to get your life insurance benefit and leave you, you have that to leave for your kids. Uh, the tax-free uninterrupted compounding is powerful because when money is allowed to grow tax-free, it grows so much more and so much faster. It's amazing when you do the numbers of tax, return, tax returns and tax-free returns, the compounding effect is phenomenal. It also allows you guaranteed results, returns, plus the dividends on your savings. It's an automatically asset-protected uh, pool of money. And finally, you have a tax-free retirement income. And I didn't talk about how you take it out um, uh, tax-free for your retirement. And for that, you need to talk to me offline. I have some resources for you related to investing on my website. If you guys are interested, it's cherrystreetinvestments.com slash resources. I have a 50 point due diligence checklist for apartments, how to uh, invest into residential real estate because I did a lot of residential real estate before I got into the commercial side. Questions? Yeah, I've got some questions for you. We've got a lot of questions over here. So I've been pre-marking them. Uh, right. So we're going to go. Um, all right. So one question, is it an ideal place to fund employee pensions, healthcare costs, and other benefits? How does it work? Yes, How you can work? set up key employee plans, like basically for your key employees, you can use that to fund their benefits. Absolutely. Gotcha. And then we're not going to be able to get to all questions. So I'm going to be a fair here, try to distribute it a little bit more. So if I don't get to you, don't get your feeling hurts. Um, all right. So can you write off interest from loan on life insurance? Um, yes, I have seen CPAs who do that. It depends on how your CPA is treating it. So uh, just let's say you're paying off, uh, you, you bought a house and just like you're writing off the interest on your, uh, uh, on your uh, mortgage, you can, you can potentially write off the interest if it's a business. Uh, yeah, it's set up as a business. Yeah. Is the whole life a uh, fixed indexed IUL or VIUL? Can you kind of explain a little bit? Yeah. Universal life is very different. You can use universal life to set up an infinite banking policy, but I don't recommend it for a lot of reasons. I could get into an, an hour discussion about IULs versus whole life policy. Uh, maybe that will be a infinite banking 201 for next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have like a, just a couple one-liners there? You can kind of share some uh, some biggest uh, downfalls there. Um, so ULs are essentially not whole life policies because they are basically term renewable annual term policies with a savings component. So the problem with annual terms is that as you get older, the cost of insurance goes up heavily, and you'll get hit, and your cash value will get hurt with ULs uh, versus whole life where your cost of insurance gets fixed at the beginning and stays the same for the entire lifetime of the policy. In ULs, your cash value can decline if the cost of insurance is too high and the policy is not funded properly. In a whole life policy, the cash value is assured to never decline unless you're moving, I mean, withdrawing from the policy, actually removing cash from the policy. And how easy is it to close the A and C? I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, is life insurance available for internationals? Uh, yes, it can be. If you have a valid um, uh, H-1B visa or some kind of visa, you can get some companies which will do it for you. Absolutely. But if you're is living internationally, uh, not in the U.S., no. Gotcha. So uh, is there a age limit on this for a healthy person? What kind of do no. you recommend? I love that question. Yeah, I have, I've recently done a policy for a 65 year old who contributed to her term life for 25 years and her term ran out and she finally realized Ramsey was not always true, uh, always right. Uh, so that that we can go into a whole hour of bashing there, but anyway, <laughs> well, we're not going to do that. Ramsey is great. I'm not going to bash Ramsey. It's <laughs> great if you're in debt or you're trying to get out of debt. If you want to grow your money, that's not the no, that's not the person to follow. Yeah, great. And then, but do you have a generally a good recommendation on age? Obviously, the younger, the better, because the rate. The younger, the better. If you can set it up when you're young, it's the best. But hey, I set up mine after I was 40, so it worked out pretty well. 
Okay. Uh, I think this one, not sure. Uh, hold on. Uh, let me see. What is the typical policy monthly premium? Uh, premium? It depends on what you're intending to put in. Generally, what we do is the size of the policy, what we call the death benefit of the policy, based on is based on how much cash you want to put into the policy. The more cash you want to push in, the bigger the policy needs to be and the bigger your contributions will be. Gotcha. Um, what additional resource can you recommend to learn more? Um, I have a couple of books that I can share with you guys. Uh, please email me. Here is my contact information. And please of course, uh, scheduling a consultation with Kavita, I think you throw in one for free, right? Is yes. You know, oftentimes you can learn so much about whole life insurance, but not only when you're specifically, not only when you're specifically talking with uh, the professional, like directly, just like a tax issue, it may work for someone, but it may not work for you. So these are like a really kind of, you got to schedule one-on-one -on -one session to really figure Right. I mean, if you have multiple pre-existing conditions, it might not work for you, but even then I've found cases where I'm able to design it. See, you don't have to have the life insurance under your name, you can have a spouse or another insurable person that you have interest in, insurable interest as we call it. You can set up a policy against them. If they are healthy, it works. I had a client who had two pre-existing conditions. I recommended, hey, this is not a right policy for you to set up on yourself, but it might be the best policy to set up for your wife who doesn't have any issues. Got it. I have, I'm gonna modify this question a little bit, uh, but growth is tax-free. Or if I take the loan from five to nine plan, is it tax free? But if I withdraw is so, okay. So I think what he meant is like, okay. when you withdraw the money from the policy, uh, is it tax free? Or is it kind of like other like 401k or five to nine, when you withdraw, you get penalized. Right. So while life insurance is tax free, a withdrawal up to cost basis. So let's say my cost basis, I put in 400,000 over the lifetime of the policy. It's tax-free up to 400,000 because that was post-tax dollars which went in. No big surprise there. But let's say the policy grew another 400,000 in those years. Now that 400,000 growth is taxable when you pull it out. But the reason we don't pull it out and we instead take loans that we never repay is because now it allows us never to pay taxes on it. You can take loans and never repay the loan and you can just let the policy uh, go until you pass away. Uh, the, your death benefit minus the loans will be paid to your heirs. So when you're retiring, you'll never repay the loans. That's the bottom line. You'll take a bunch of loans, drain the cash value, tax-free, and then tax, uh, death benefit minus the um, loan amount is what is paid to your heirs. Okay, the other question is typically the way insurance company provides a guarantee minimal is by trading options. How much of the total assets are they trading in options and as such? Do they, they cap the number of months? They don't invest in options. So whole life companies who do whole life policies like Penn Mutual, they do only safe assets like corporate bonds. Uh, corporate bonds are not the bonds in the stock market. They're not the stock market bonds. They're not something you and I buy. Uh, Coke might be setting up a plant in Atlanta. They might go invest into that. Um, they buy real estate, like big real estate uh, deals. So they don't, they're not investing in the stock market. None of your money is going to the market. Yeah, they do much bigger real estate investments. Sometimes people would say the minimum is like five million or more. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, are there any strategies where you can combine your 401k and a policy contribution? I love this question. Unfortunately, I've been asked this question. So I'll give you our two answers. One, with CARES Act, you can remove money from your 401k, right? Withdrawals uh, up to $100,000. The loan uh, up to $100,000 is the time period has expired. So technically, a 401k is not you, right? Remember that your 401k is a separate entity. You cannot take that money out of from your 401k and invested in an infinite banking policy because that infinite banking policy is yours. The 401k is a separate entity that is not yours. So no. Gotcha. Yeah, typically how long is the season and period before you borrow on it? You can borrow day one. You just can't borrow 100% of it day one. Uh, usually 100% of it, we try to structure it so that 100% of it is available after year five. 
four or five. That's the earliest we are able to do. If people are younger, it might happen year four. All right. So is there a lock in period? Does it lock in period? Does it need contribution yearly? So the way I structure it for most of my investors is that they say, hey, I want to contribute X number of years. They can pick the years. I usually say it's great if you can contribute at least three years, preferably five to seven years. After that, we make the policy pay for itself. You never have to worry about it. It just keeps uh, growing. So for self-employed, do you recommend getting riders disability and long-term care insurance? So I, exp I tell you, don't mix your insurance policies with all these other riders because you're just going to drive up the cost of insurance. What I would say is go get a disability rider on the side, go get life long-term care on the side, because that will be more effective than trying to have one policy do a lot of things because you're just gonna drive up the cost of insurance. And I also told you, I'm gonna tell you one more thing, which is very important for me, it will be for you. If you're a real estate professional for tax purposes, your post-tax dollars is actually tax-free, right? You have paid post-tax dollars, you haven't paid taxes because you, let's say, wrote off all your income with depreciation. Now, you're putting tax-free dollars into an insurance policy, allowing it to grow tax-free, taking it out at retirement tax-free. I can't think of any other vehicle which allows you to do that. So after I found this, I was like, I'm not going to do a 401k ever again because my dollars are tax-free. Why would I do a 401k? Why would, I can do a Roth, but it's only 6k. I don't know of any post-tax account that allows tax-free growth. This is the only one. And so I use my policy. If you're a real estate professional for tax purposes, this is a great vehicle to use as your retirement account. Yeah. And so one more thing to that, Kavita, though, the only exception on 401k is if your employee match is big. So there may be a yes. reason to do it. Absolutely. Uh, no, no question if you have an employee match, but I'm talking about self-employed people who are realistic ah, gotcha. for tax yeah. purposes. Like me, I don't have any reason to contribute to a 401k when all my do dollars are post-tax dollars, which are tax-free for me. Gotcha. And then we're out of time with that. Thank you so much for all your questions. Again, I, we can answer everybody's question. Some of these are very specific. So definitely draw down Kavita's information, set up a follow-up consultation with her, and you can go through this in more detail. Um, yeah, awesome. To follow that link and uh, you can set up a consult with me. Um, I will talk about how we can tailor this and also deep dive into how the policy is structured because that's really important, right? You can, I have a lot of people who will go shop around. I recommend you can shop around all you want, but find someone who understands this concept, not just willy-nilly anybody who does insurance. Yeah, there's only a, a few folks that in the country kind of does this. I wouldn't say like a handful or something, there's still quite a bit, uh, but make sure this is very different concept than a financial advisor, what they're trying to sell you. So don't mix the two concepts over here, even though it's the same vehicle. So the cool. other thing well, I want to point out is if you have an existing policy, like a UL, a VUL, IUL, whatever else, you can call, do what's called a 1035 exchange, basically rolling over the funds from your current policy to the new policy, which is structured for IB. And that'll help you accelerate your cash value much better. So even if you have a policy that's not working very well for you, we can work around that and move the funds over. Gotcha. Cool. All right. So we're going to move on to Ramesh.